I see strong winds coming, so hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. The way the world has moved in its understanding of competition is a very unhelpful, deadly way to move from economic competition to geostrategic competition is not the right thing. In US-China relations, war by design there is war deployed as an instrument of policy, as Mr. Putin has done in Ukraine, is, I think, highly unlikely. What is, cannot be ruled out, unfortunately, is conflict by accident, through miscalculation or some incident uh, getting out of hand, and most dangerously, in the Taiwan Straits. At present, what is driving US-China competition is the domestic politics of both countries. Uh, and that makes it very hard to deal with because neither wants to look weak. It also means that the scope to limit competition by either side or by third parties is very small. But for a start, I think both sides will have to drop their illusions about each other uh, if they are going to reach a new modus vivendi to stabilize their competition. The US will have to accept China for what it is and stop trying to change China or talking about change in China. Uh, it is what it is. China, on its, on its part, will have to stop believing its own propaganda about the East being in ascendance and the West being in decline. Uh, the changes in the distribution of power are real, of course, but they are only relative and not absolute. And as Ukraine has shown, the West is still capable, despite all its problems, and there are serious problems, of acting decisively, indeed ruthlessly, if it, not, it needs to. The US and Europe have many problems, but China should not make Mr. Putin's mistake of underestimating it. The single most consequential thing that would improve US-China relations is, of course, if Beijing changes its position on the war in Ukraine. Uh, that will not end competition, but will greatly stabilize it. Unfortunately, uh, while changing position on Ukraine will have a high impact on US-China relations, the probability of that happening is very low, for a very simple reason. China has no other partner anywhere in the world of comparable rate weight with Russia that shares its distrust of the West. All of the rest of us need to come together to help China and America work through how to head off this competition that has now emerged. My belief is that the world has transmogrified its understanding of competition from an earlier time to now a deadly version. The earlier time of competition was when the rest of the world, America in particular, helped bring China into the community of nations and encouraged intense competition in trade. That was economic competition. It was the kind of competition that you win by making yourself better. It's the kind of competition that America would win by improving its infrastructure, training its people, leveraging its human capital, improving its research and development. It's the kind of competition that made China better and helped China lift over 650 million people out of poverty. The competition that we have moved to today is not that kind of competition. It is a kind of competition that's encapsulated in the word techno-nationalism, among other things. It is the idea that you win by encircling others, by containing others, by putting others down, by engaging in zero-sum game competition. And the way the world has moved in its understanding of competition is a very unhelpful, deadly way 
to move from economic competition to geostrategic competition is not the right thing. The Chinese economy is transitioning toward a new development model. To improve, we need large-scale formation of our industrial capacity so that it is enabled by technology and also to build capacities in new industries, uh, such as uh, those sectors driven by low carbon emissions. The current geopolitical tensions make this process a national imperative. Now, it is not, uh, it's now not just driven by economics, but by national security. In the next 10 years, there will be tremendous investment and growth opportunities, manufacturing technologies, supply chain optimization, artificial intelligence, semiconductors, life sciences, and medical equipment, new alternative energy like EV and new materials. All this, I think, makes the West, particularly the US, feel threatened and insecure. And that's understandable. China would be the continent of stability and growth. Now, another key asset for China going forward in the future is political predictability. We know who will be in charge and what their policies will be. We certainly cannot say this about America or Europe now, perhaps not about anywhere else. I'm a businessman, I'm an investor. Uh, if there's one truism about investing in China, it's this, don't bet against the five-year plan. I think Eric is right that Chinese system has certain advantages that it can take decisions and pursue them over the long term. But that's an advantage only if the decision was the correct one in the first place. And over the last 10 years, the movement has been much more towards more control. And there are good reasons for it, but that's the fact. So I think um, it remains to be seen whether the decisions that are going to be taken are the correct ones. Just to modify an ancient Chinese saying or what is called ancient Chinese saying, you know, a journey of a thousand years begins with a single step, right? But a single step in the right direction. <laughs> I think along some of these dimensions, there's now a fair amount of predictability, uh, regardless of which party is, uh, is in power. And I think it's, it's important to understand that fundamental change that has occurred in the, in the U.S. over the last roughly decade, uh, decade or so, from the, um, the earlier um, benign competition period to the more uh, geostrategic, um, more zero-sum approach. I think that's here to stay. I don't think that's a Republican or Democratic thing. I think uh, China probably would continue to rely on domestic uh, market. Uh, that's the primary uh, uh, source of uh, China's uh, economic growth in the days to come. Uh, even though we are facing some uh, difficulties because of COVID restrictions and also because of uh, other factors, I think uh, uh, eventually uh, we'll get over those difficulties and, and, and uh, the domestic uh, economy would expand. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot uh, do without uh, international trade and, and uh, global economic linkages. Uh, China believes that uh, uh, interdependence is still in China's interest and uh, uh, will continue to adhere to this unless something drastic happens. China has adapted uh, in its economic strategies in ways that I think that the rest of us have always found surprising. Now, where we go from here, how China continues to adapt here, given that Made in China 2025 is now the sinusure of techno-nationalism. It is where not only was China successful, it became potentially world-leading. Graham Allison, the scholar at Harvard Kennedy School, described 11 areas of technology. In 10 of those, China was either imminent or already world leading. This is a problem because we're viewing this in terms of our zero-sum competition, geostrategic rivalry. Technonationalism intentionally conflates economic competition with a concern for security and values. And in doing that, it is what has driven competition towards being zero sum. Um, my own preferred solution would be that we in Asia say to America and China, this is the Asia 
that Asia wants. We don't try and, and get into the middle of that particular confrontation. We say, the rest of the world, this is what we think would work for us. We want that part of American security and rule of law and level playing field. We want this part of China manufacturing prowess. We work on the best of each side to give all sides confidence and self-assurance. I think that would be my preferred way ahead, rather than trying to divert a made in China 2025 strategy, which actually is working. And it's working in the way that exactly the rest of the world wanted it to work. <laughs>